I'm here in New York talking to Charles Stuckey in his home and office uh, on the Upper West Side. And my first question for you, Charles, is what was modernism? I'm not sure I know, but I, I, but I, but I think from uh, you know, various contexts that I've read it in or heard it in that it is the, um, that it is the, the current mode of art Making which uh, which is rooted back to the middle of the nineteenth century, where um, inst instead of making art about tradition, one's making art about modern life, and, ha and how that's evolved until now. I mean, that's how I would. One of the particular images I wanted to talk to you about was uh, Gustav Kleibot's *Paris Street Rainy Day*. Mm -hmm. um, which you have written about in the past, and you were also at the Institute of. The Art Institute of Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where, in fact, this painting, this painting is. Yeah. I used to walk, walk past it nearly every day. Yeah. I actually came upon it completely by chance. I didn't realize that it was there. I was in Chicago on a conference, uh -huh. and I, I was walking around the gallery, and there it was. And I've used it for many years in my teaching. I well, certainly it was that way for me as well. I mean, when, yeah. I, when, I, when I was first at the Art Institute of Chicago, my museum, my, my, my education at that point, yeah. you know, hadn't really included Kaibot. You yeah. know, I went to college in the 1960s, mm. and at that point, you know, when one talked about Impressionism, they did, you didn't discuss it in sufficient detail to include Kaibot. I don't yeah. think people really felt that he mattered very much. No, he's very much, he was very much considered, I think, a very minor... Mar but minor player. I mean, that's yeah. how the history was read up until Kirk Varnado did his show. Yeah. In, yeah. What was that, 1978 maybe, or 77, yeah. Yeah. So tell me about the image. Um, when, you know, when you first sort of, when you first sort of discovered it yourself, uh, what was, what was your impression of it? Well, I was extremely impressed by it. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, it's, it's one of the collection highlights in Chicago where they also have Seurat's painting roughly mm. the same size of the island of the Grand Jardin. I guess it's the, the Seurat's, um, you, you, you know, th those were, were the two uh, parentheses for their very, very important collection of late yeah. 19th century French painting. And um, so I wanted to find out more about Kayabad. And also, you know, I think I was, I, I was, it was the kind of pic picture as an experience that uh, kind of disturbed everything that I brought with me as learning. Uh, by which I mean to say that um, it, it's very impressive. It's it's life size. You almost mm. feel as if you could walk away into it. You know mm. that you could just step into the picture of the people that are in it, or step out of it, and so yeah. on and so forth. So it has that kind of intimacy about it on the um, be, because of Kai Butt's extraordinary competence, mm. especially with perspective, yeah. and. Um, and yet, you know, I had learned that Impressionism was about um, turning your back on all of that. And I had learned that yeah. Impressionism was about works that were painted very stenographically and quickly and therefore tended to be sort of portable in scale. Yeah. And, here, and here was, you know, this museum in Chicago mm. that had this very, very large work by an artist I had never heard of mm. who was associated with the Impressionists but seemed to be doing everything that they weren't. Yeah. And, and that, you know, that piqued my curiosity, I think, and, and uh, to want to know more and more about Kayabad. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I, I, thanks to the attention he got beginning in the late 70s, I mean, I think it, yeah. it totally transformed, you know, people's understanding of that period. The, the, what you say about the uh, being surprised by the scale of it, that was my impression as well when I, I first saw it. I, I was taken aback by how it's a quite a theatrical scale, but it's also, um, I, I think of it as being quite a photographic work. Right. Do you think that would be a fair comment? 
Yeah, I think so. But I'm, but I mean, I, when when you or I say photographic today, yeah, and we walk outside and maybe there's a thousand pictures being taken just within a block of us yeah, here in New York yeah. and on cell phones and so on and so forth. I mean, at the time, yeah, photographic was entirely different. I mean, it, it, it was yeah. an, it was a, a, an art form and an, a form of artisanship itself. Mm. You know, so yes, I do think it's photographic that way, and particularly photographic of, you know. Of that time, in the sense, yeah, that, yeah, uh, yeah. And, um, and given the limitation at that time in terms of of, of um, you know photography's inability to work color yet, and mm. uh, you know its limitations when it came to showing movement, I mean the sort of staid space. I mean, what, what has it? With, the, the picture is so empty that that it's occurred to me that. Um, you know, his, his hope like that of a photographer would have been, you know, to concentrate on his scene without the interruption of pedestrians passing by. Yeah. And that, you know, in the, in the process of being there, he nevertheless had to, uh, had to deal with the reality of the fact that there would yeah. be some people out on a rainy day, yeah. you know, inter inter interfering slightly with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, you, you mentioned also about the perspective and uh, I've recently been to this intersection in Paris. Uh, one of the interesting things about when you go there, I mean, the lamp is in the same place, which is quite interesting. But the most interesting thing about the, the space itself is that it actually is smaller than it looks in, in Kaibot's rendering of it. So there's, a, there's an accentuation of the perspective uh, that you get, I think, in, in Kaibot's rendering of that particular physical do you think that he intended that, or was, or, or was just sort of uh, by accident that it happened that way? I don't know. You it's so hard to judge. I mean, when you look at a yeah. photograph and you, you get a, a sort of an imaginary idea of the scale, and then when, and, and then when you go yeah. to the actual place, maybe years later, you you'll find that there's an inconsistency between yeah. you know what you saw in a book and or a magazine, and then where you are. And I wonder whether that's you know, about the discrepancy between the, the two images or whether that somehow it's has to do with your expectations and anticipation and so on. It's, 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 no, I, I it's think more it's, complicated than we could know, but... Yeah, I think it's... I think it's maybe, maybe that's absolutely right. I mean, for me, uh, when I first saw the scene, I thought this looks like it's a major inter intersection of boulevards mm -hmm. in Paris. Uh, but it's you know they're actually you know reasonably small streets. They 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 still are part of that. Uh, as far as I know, that sort of Haussmann um, redesigning of Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, it is near the the Pont Europe and the uh, the Gare Saint Lazare. Okay. It's kind of in that in that area. Um, so it was part of that uh, reconfiguration of, of Paris. I I wonder that. Uh, the, the the scale I mean maybe it is perception but if it if if it's not I wonder if that the scale that Kaibot gives the scene has something to do with the monumentality that he sees you know th there is this tension I think um, in impressions between you know the, a kind of a monumental often monumental I mean if you have if you were if you were you know um, if you went to Paris and you stood where Dugas presumably stood yeah. to make the Place de la Concorde picture with yeah. the man and his daughters and their dog and stuff walking across it. Would you have the same response or would you think that Degas' rendition was closer to what you felt if you were standing there? In terms of the scene that it depicts, um, you've written something quite interesting about what you've called a standoff, I think. Oh, between these people on the side. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I always, you know, I've had a tendency all of my um, career to be interested in the humor in art, which yeah. were, which which go, which got me off to a rather bad start because, yeah. but believe it or not, in the 1960s and 70s and even in the 80s, I mean, if you would if you spoke to serious people about that and said, well, you know, there's mm -hmm. a sense of humor here, it it didn't correspond to their um, very, very uh, strict idea that mm. art should be something quite serious, mm. you know. 
But that it lacks I, intellectual depth if it's humorous in some yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, but um, but but I I I, th I I thought that was altogether wrongheaded, and eventually, mm. you know, I th the I, I thinking would change, and it has. Mm. Um, so in in this particular um, painting, mm. I, I I just I took amusement from how he had captured a very what I thought was a very typical moment in Paris where there's where the sidewalks are rather mm. narrow mm. and um, you know very often as you're walking down them there'll be oblivious people heading towards you who would you know, like would push you out underneath an oncoming bus or yeah. what they don't they wouldn't you know th you know think of their surroundings so I mean there is a sense in which the, at least the couple walking down the sidewalk are oblivious to where they are. Mm. They're talking to one another, and you mm. can see that they're oblivious, mm. just like you can see where they are. Yeah, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're and so I, distracted and I, there. And I find that that gives a special charm to the picture. Yeah. You know. One of the other things that set me on a bit of a, a wild goose chase about the picture was my inability to come up with any other images that I knew mm. of the modern umbrella. I mean, oh. I thought, you know, what, what, what images could I... There are pictures by Tiepolo and things where people yeah. have sunshades. And yeah, there, I was going to say pictures, Monet, there's and there's, and there's, and there's pictures of, of, of... But I mean, this idea of a sort of a collapsible, mm. you know, waterproof umbrella and so on and so forth. How come, you know... If, if, if that had been invented, how come nobody ever bothered to depict it? And it took a while before it dawned on me to, you know, that nobody, like a photographer, couldn't yeah. be working on a rainy day. Yeah. I think there is in the Library of Congress, I think they have a, a picture of, you know, Lincoln giving his second inaugural address or something in the day which raining into somebody with an umbrella right. there or something like that. But, uh, but it's just because the very condition that would require an umbrella is a condition that would, at that point in time, you know, discourage the creation of images. Yeah, that's true. You know, the light was wrong and the... The interesting thing about it, um, and you saying that has actually just made me realize this as well. The in one of the interesting things about the image is that um, it's a rainy day. I mean, you can see the rain mm -hmm. on the street. Which is again, the yeah, pretty impressionist. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Yeah. And the, the tightness, it's actually, you know, it's a very, as Kybot's work is as well, generally. Um, but there, there's a you know I was saying about it being photographic in a in a sort of a 19th century sense. There is no actual rain falling. There's no depiction of rain falling, and right. it it makes me wonder if um, if he maybe worked from photographic studies in which you know you talk about long exposure times where that wouldn't have been captured anyway. But obviously it was important at that time to yeah. to Kyabat and the group to deal with that, that it was so hard to paint rain. I mean, the next yeah. year, there's those pictures of his on the river that show the splashing of the rain, you know, yeah. uh, onto the pavement and, and, and the surface of the water and yeah. rippling out and so on and so forth. And then you get Van Gogh out there yeah. actually, you know, painting painting the drops quite seriously as if it was yeah. just something that, you know, in a pictorial fashion had, to, you, you know, if you were going to be a painter, why couldn't you paint that? Yeah. Have you any sort of speculation about what, what, what the fascination is with with rain? Right about that time, is it captured? You know, I, 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 I just think that. Well, I mean, and maybe I'm, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm wrong-headed, but, but I think that there was a certain um, luck, let's call it, where uh, there was such a confluence of extremely talented artists mm. in, a, in, a, in a in a rather small neighborhood, who, as a result of that, were able to challenge one another in in the most beneficial way and um and, 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 and with the result that you 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 I, I you kind of can sense them wanting to challenge themselves to ever more ridiculously difficult things mm. to capture on canvas yeah you know that they, they had a new kind of keyboard that, that to, to work with yeah. and um uh, they they wanted to work you know super fast to r r record what they saw not what they thought about yeah and um, yeah and I think rain was just in that you know it was it, it was one of those things snow working in the snow yeah um, you know it, it's uh, 
there was an ambition to, to be able to paint what, what few of any other people had ever done, been able to paint before or could, could bring themselves yeah. to master as painters and so on and so forth. That, um, I guess we tend to not, not think that much about. To what extent does that uh, wanting to work at speed, because um, also Monet is another example of you know, an artist who working you know, plein air at speed, uh, things like Rouen Cathedral, uh, that those images. Um, do you do you think that uh, there is something of modernity, more broadly speaking, that's reflected in that particular approach? In working as fast as possible. Mm. Yeah, I do. I do, yeah, I do think that it's um, it it's, it, it, re it certainly reflects the time that they're living in and the awareness of. Um, Physiology. I mean, the, the awareness. I, I mean, when when did when, when did scientists first discover? I think it's at the beginning of the nineteenth century that vision actually takes place in um, particular forms of cells on the retina, rods and cones, yeah. and so on and so forth. And, and, yeah. and could give some approximate idea of the uh, of the process of vision. Well, well, once you know that, I mean, then mm -hmm. then in in certain moments of your looking, you. You know, you can you can sense it a little bit, uh, mm. but I don't. But I but I think you know someone living before that was known. I'm not so sure that they would think about it the same way. So mo 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 modernist in that respect. Mm. Yeah. It's it's yeah. It's it's very hard to judge like what what would happen if you took something away or if you added something. I mean, history is doing that yeah. all the time. Yeah. And yet. Um, Whenever you have a thought like that, that you know, it's, it's, it was the addition of this that changed yeah. everything. Uh, there's no way to be sure about it. I mean, it's just, um, it's just a possible uh, way to think about it. You know, that might be more or less useful. Yeah, I think when you know, when I, I before I was saying it's photographic, and that's continuing from the point that you just made as well. I think that uh, I can't help be knowing that you know this was produced you know when photography was in the midst of becoming completely uh, well, amongst the middle classes much more popularized that there is something also about the the, the, the framing um, within this picture I think that and by that I mean particularly the way that there's a cutoff the guy who's being challenged in this duel right, on the on pavement the sidewalk, right. yeah is cut off you know halfway halfway down um, so there's a sense of I think there's a sense of the world continuing either side of the edge. I guess. Of the Although, haven't you noticed that uh, that that happens in 17th century pictures and 16th century pictures really? too? Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, okay. it's not. It, it gets more and more prevalent yeah. in the 19th century, and yeah. I'm sure that the association that you just that you just uh, explained is yeah. absolutely right. That that is the correct association when you have half of a figure in and out. It's um, mm. Um, it becomes circumstantial. I mean, it, it's, a, yeah. it's, it's the painter sort of saying, well, I stood here and, you know, this is what I tried to paint and somebody, you know, came and left before I could get them. I mean, it's, it's about that um, unavoidable circum mm. circumstance. But, um, but it's not unique. I mean, there are, there are exceptions to, yeah. or historical exceptions.